Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. This is, of course, Brave New Work, a podcast about reinventing our organizations and the search for a more adaptive and human way of working. I'm Aaron Dignan, and I am joined by my co-host, Rodney Evans. Hey there. This is the fifth episode in our 13-part Ready for Anything series on finding a better way of working through pandemics, because why not? Um, On today's episode, we're going to talk about strategy, how we should plan and prioritize in this moment, if we should, how we should. Uh, But before we unpack that, we will do our, uh, you know, regular habitual check-in round. As is tradition and also good practice. Our check-in question for today is this one. Now that you are exclusively working from home, what is the feature of your home that you are appreciating the most? Okay, cool. So I have a two part answer. One is we finished the kitchen project just in time, like days before the pandemic hit. So we can actually cook, which is nice, because otherwise, I think I would already be in a really bad state of mind. Um, And the second thing is that we decided to move to a park when we moved to Denver from New York. And there was a lot of debate in the family about whether that was a good idea. And now it's like, such a good idea. Mm -hmm. Like we walk right out the front door with the dog and we are in a public park and it's a quiet one to boot. So uh, very happy with that choice and that amenity. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I mostly just appreciate that I have a proper home office. (laughs) A lot of my friends, particularly my New York friends are cobbling together places and corners and niches to work out of in their small apartments. I have a beautiful home office that has been set up to do just exactly this thing since long before this started. So um, I am very appreciative that uh, that didn't (laughs) take any cognitive load or logistical doing on my part. I just kind of did what I always do, except with less plane travel. That's right. I love it. So uh, today's topic is strategy. And I want to start by asking you, you know, why is strategy important right now? What's what if it, I was like, it's not, strategy? no big deal. Then we can call it a short out. <laughs> <laughs> Just wrap this show up. <laughs> Thanks for being here, everybody. <laughs> so think- um, strategy, it's, it's going to be funny to see in the pop culture how the sort of ebb and flow of the discussion topics trend because obviously week one was like, work from home. Oh my God. Let's make memes, video, bah, pajamas. Yeah. And then week two was like, oh, recession. <laughs> oh shit. Okay. <laughs> what are we going to do? Bail and, out. and soon, soon we're going to start talking about strategy, both because it's the end of Q1. So a lot of folks are looking back at their first quarter. They're doing budget reforecasting. They're thinking mm-hmm. about strategy iteration like they would be anyway. But also now, it seems like a moment to really consider how the external environment and market is impacting our strategy and particularly to carve out the time to do that so that we don't just like keep a 2020 strategy that we made last November when none of this had even started yet uh, and then find ourselves uh, not surprised certainly that we haven't met it because nobody thinks that's going to happen, but uh, having not really had any conversation to think about how to alter it. Yeah, I, my, some of my favorite tweets lately have been coming from people that are associated with the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable uh-huh. that are like, how's that budget going? <laughs> 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 Which is just really funny. Um, and so, great. you know, it's almost cruel, but it's funny. Uh, yeah, and I think, I think yeah, basically all, you know, all plans that were previously in place are off. By the way, even, even up to and including businesses that are doing really well right now. Yep, like imagine absolutely. being Zoom or Amazon right now and being like, whoa. We have, you know, a hundred percent month over month demand on the system. What does that do to your strategy? What does that do to your resources? So everybody's in a in a state of reactivity right now. In this episode, we're gonna do two things that we always do and a third thing that we don't usually do. The two things we always do are talk about principles around strategy and practices that we would recommend that you use this moment. And the third thing that we don't normally do is let Aaron's uh, strategy freak flag fly because this is what he used to do for a living. And he's actually really dope at the content side of this. So um, he's going to feed in some dank nugs as we go through the whole strategy discussion. I can't wait to hear what I say. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay. So um, do you want to start with uh, just a little bit about what we have already covered as a refresher as it relates to strategy, and then we'll move on from there? Yeah. So I think to get grounded on strategy for a second, the first thing to say that's more big picture and, and sort of theory level setting is there's a lot of um, 
overdoing it in strategy in the traditional model. And I think what most evolutionary orgs, teal orgs, new ways of working, you know, teams are thinking about is, mo- you know, a lot of strategy is an emergent property of having a really clear purpose and having decentralized, empowered teams just navigating the world, right? Like you get, you get emergent strategy where things just happen, great ideas get done, things that work get doubled down on, things that don't go away. So a lot of that work of kind of like trying to predict and control everything does go away in a system that is, you know, living to the values that we often espouse. However, the, you know, the individuals and the teams still have to do some kind of strategy. They still have to prioritize. They still have to make decisions about what they do. And so there are a lot of great practices for that. Um, two that we've already covered in some depth on, on the series so far. Uh, one is even over statements. So one good thing, even over another good thing. And we may touch briefly in on those again later when we start to talk about the power of counterintuitive ideas in moments like this. And then the second is um, scenario planning. So actually going through the work of imagining all these possible futures and ways things can go right and wrong and left and right and black swans and all that so that you have a level of preparation, a level of, you know, preparedness and readiness to, to tackle what comes. And you can kind of dust off that idea or that model or that reaction and say, oh, yeah, we, we already thought about what might happen if this occurs and it did. And so now we kind of know what our move is. So those two are already in the can, but now we want to shift gears and talk about some of the other things that we can be doing from a strategy perspective. So where do you want to start on the list of new things? I want to start with essentialism. Awesome. Okay. Greg. So yes, our, our, uh, our friend and hero, Greg McEwen, who wrote essentialism, Defining and refining essential intent is something that we do a lot with our clients. Essential intent is a concrete yet also inspiring statement that lives somewhere between a vision or mission and a quarterly goal kind of thing. And I've been really encouraging those that I'm working with in the moment to finally, for real, get serious (laughs) about what is essential. And now we have the environment in our favor because in the boom times where we're all very abundant, we don't have a natural tendency toward what is essential because we get Mm -hmm. real grabby and real greedy and we're like, we'll do all the things and then we'll just hire more people to do more things and then more. (laughs) But right now we don't get to do any of that because of what's happening in the market and also because we just don't have as much luxury of communication and time and information as we usually do. And so what I've been asking folks to do in this time as they think about strategy is to get super, super clear on for a time period that looks something like the next year, what is the essential outcome that they are aiming for? And to be a little bit brave in doing that to Mm -hmm, be clear, mm -hmm. but also be like a little bit aggressive in saying what it is so that they're clear on what it's not. Yeah, I like the the aspect of essential intent, which is kind of where do you want to be? So if you think about your purpose or your vision as where, you know, what we're serving on the long, long time horizon of decades or, or even centuries, um, there's this other p- problem of, well, then where do we need to be in two years or three years or one year in order to be on the path to that outcome or on the path to really serving that? And it can vary wildly depending on the business and the unit and the team. But answering that question is really important. So I think about it as outcomes, but I also really like to think about it as positioning. Mm -hmm. Like, where do we want to be positioned after this pandemic? Mm -hmm. Do we want to have a lot of cash on hand or not? Do we want to be the same size or bigger or smaller? Do we want to be offering the same service mix or not? Like all those things that tell us a story about here's where we want to be so that we're set up for what's next. And Essential Intent does a great job of that. And it's, I mean, it should be brief. It should be, you know, a paragraph or two. It should fit on a single slide or a single page. It's, you know, it's it has that in common with things like OKRs and, and strategic mm-hmm. objectives, right? It's brief. But to your point, it's specific, mm-hmm. specific enough that we kind of know if we got there, um, you know, within a margin of error. Mm-hmm. So besides essentialism or essential intent work, uh, what are some of your other top hits for doing strategy in this, in the time of Corona? <laughs> Strategy in the time of Mm -hmm. Corona. That's our Um, our forthcoming novel. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Uh, So I think one one thing that really connects to essential intent, to establishing that positioning, is what's you know sort of your portfolio strategy or Mm -hmm. your mix of bets, your mix of investments, your mix of services that whatever you're bringing into that future state. 
And one of the things we talked about briefly in the book is this idea of a barbell strategy. So saying, all right, we have, you know, sure things and wild swings. Mm -hmm. The sure things are things that we know are going to play out. The wild swings are, are, you know, something that's kind of innovative and, and potential, but we never know. I know yesterday when you and I were talking about this episode, you also mentioned the kind of like three horizons framework, right? Mm -hmm. Like what's, you know, what's kind of near term, what's long term. I think all that is important right now. And the thing we need to be doing is asking ourselves, well, what changes about the way we would normally do that under these conditions, Mm -hmm. right? So do you still have an 80-20 mix of sure things and wild swings? Do you actually believe that your sure things are sure things? Because I actually think that's where the most destabilization is happening right now is Mm -hmm. like stuff we used to do. Like, for example, for the ready, uh, doing workshops to get people started on Brave New Work total sure thing 60 days ago, like right. came in every month. We didn't have to go out and look for them. Everybody wanted them. They went well, they were well regarded. Uh, and guess what? I have no, no idea mass. when we can sell one of those again sure. in the regular way. And so that now it have to sort of look at like, well, we all, we had this, you know, kind of second horizon thing of like virtual workshops and webinars that we never took very seriously. Now that has to be pulled forward mm-hmm. into the present. And so I think just like a real, a uh, ruthless look at your portfolio of bets, your portfolio of activities, your portfolio of investments and saying, all right, what is actually still a sure thing? What isn't? And what's the mix of things that we think we can realize during the pandemic, after the pandemic or well into the future? And then based on the amount of uh, you know risk tolerance we have and the amount of resources we have on hand, what kind of bets can we make? And I think the companies that really come out of this well are going to be the ones that were positioned well going in. They had enough resource. They had been smart and conservative. And they also have, they know when to exercise that risk appetite. So when people like Amazon talk about making seven year bets, Mm -hmm. like who's making seven year bets today, Mm -hmm. right? And those people are going to definitely um, have, you know, very nonlinear outcomes. Now they might, you know, a lot of them will fail, right? Because that's, that's casino math. But but the ones that succeed, it's going to look really prescient that it was like, oh, smart. You started an all remote conference system during the pandemic. And 10 years later, it's like the biggest, you know, it's the TED of Mm -hmm. of conferences. Right. And we didn't see that coming. Mm -hmm. I dig that. Another exercise we often do in strategy workshops uh, that teams can do now is to do some red teaming. So I love doing red teaming exercises. Uh, This is something we did a lot of when I worked at McChrystal Group. It's something that I really enjoy doing with teams because it feels like the combination of uh, real, like tangible strategy work, but also creativity and innovation Mm -hmm. and imagination. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those things don't live together. And it's so fun when they do live together. So let's talk a little bit about red teaming. And for those who maybe haven't done this before, this is really about imagining who could kill us. So (laughs) inventing the business that could crush our business. And right now, uh, it is particularly interesting to think about that because there's a whole different set of variables. So, um, So you've done a lot of this work, Aaron. Maybe talk a little bit about what people could be thinking of that they should think of anyway in terms of red teaming, but particularly in this moment. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the usual brief for a red team exercise is like, Hey, let's go away and let's invent the company that could kill us with, you know, in the current environment. I think now it's just interesting and novel because the environment itself is way more destabilizing for us. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a couple ways you could do it. One way is you could just say like, what will the winners look like who come out of this Mm -hmm. either during this or after this? Like what would, let's describe what they look like and what's their anatomy and what's their mix of products or services and the way they go to market and all that. So we could almost define like, what is a great winner going to look like? And then backtrack that into, well, what might we want to change to be more similar to that, you know, winning state. Mm -hmm. Um, Another version of red teaming might be, you know, what about the current system or scenario, or, or in this case, pandemic is unlocking a new possibility. And let's define what that business is, which there's probably some overlap, but I find that when you give different prompts, you get slightly different answers. Mm -hmm. So saying like, what's the, what's the one thing that's true now that now makes it easier than ever to beat you? Right. Like now what's the one thing that makes it really, really hard for for your version of this to sustain? And how does that look in, you know, in a red team competitor? Mm -hmm. And I think, 
you know, you can connect the dots between all these, uh, you know, pieces of programming here, right? Because you can take your even overstatements and look at some of the things you chose to prioritize and then compare that to your red team scenario and be like, are we prioritizing the same things as the winners? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, are we, are we prioritizing things that will align with that essential intent? And, and generally speaking, when we're doing these sorts of exercises, I sort of ask people to like be realistic, but not to the point of being critical. Mm-hmm. So, you know, people will often come up to me and be like, can we imagine that this happens? And it's like, well, do you honestly think it could happen? Like, mm-hmm. do you have some semblance of it? You have a 10% confidence that it could happen? Then let's play it out, right? Because that sort of gets back into the scenario planning side of this is if you think there's a 10% chance that somebody could come in and eat your lunch doing X, Y, or Z, then yeah, let's play that out and let's see what we can learn from it and what we can borrow from it. So, uh, so that's the, you know, the long and short of red teaming and it, it, you know, where I want to go next is talking about, um, how being counterintuitive works across all these tools if it's done well to kind of set up where we need to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's so much work to do in any kind of strategy exercise that's about looking at the market and understanding competitors and thinking critically about what they have that we don't and what we have that they don't. (laughs) And then there's the third way, which is what is the thing that nobody sees coming that is actually going to be the dominant strategy, which I think is the most interesting place to party and also uh, the most challenging. Yeah, totally. At some level, um, strategy is really just about identifying that lever. It's mm-hmm. about looking at what's happening and saying, what do I think is likely to be the the deciding factor that others are undervaluing or not seeing? And that I think opens up an opportunity space, a white space for us to kind of fill with this idea, with this concept, with this product, with this potential. And so at some level, when you're looking at your strategy and your portfolio and your scenario plans and your even overs and everything, it's all about saying, well, what parts of this are we actually taking a stance on Mm -hmm. that's actually novel? Mm -hmm. Because if everybody's taking the exact same stance, then we don't have a strategy. We're just doing, you know, the same thing as everybody else. And that leads to similar outcomes. So if every airline coming out of this is like, we're going to do the same five things, that's not really strategy. Like, I guess it's strategy in the sense that like, you're navigating against the market together. So you're strategizing your own survival or your own outcome versus zero. But it's not strategy versus competition. That only happens when you have a different idea. Right. It's, it is strategy, but it's a strategy that basically comes down to an execution play. Because if right. you're just going to do the same thing as everybody else, then the only way you, you do win it is a little by better. doing it better. That's right. Yeah, uh, I like Which that. is not super interesting. Yeah, it doesn't have a, a very unbalanced upside for whoever gets it right. You might, you know, you can execute better and get a little bit of a better result. But to really see things differently is to have, you know, a, an outsized result, a dramatically better result for someone else. And honestly, that's, I mean, I have spent hours and hours and hours over the last two weeks just sort of sitting with the thought of like, what am I missing? What am I missing? What am I missing? What are they missing? What am I missing? Mm-hmm. What are they missing? And you have to kind of put your sense making goggles on and just start looking for like, what's the thing that nobody is really valuing correctly or understanding? And then start to think about how to act on that. And you don't have to bet the farm, right? You can make a small, you know, 10% investment today in a counterintuitive idea that can really net out like bigger than your whole business in a few years. Another point to make on strategy, no matter which of these tactics you're using to refresh it is just to think about cadence. So we're all enjoying the jokes right now about how, you know, March has been the longest year ever, but really (laughs) the way things are changing right now, the rhythm with which you are looking at and refreshing your strategy should match the external environment. So traditionally you might've been an older school company that said, we have a one-year plan. Maybe you're a little bit newer school that says, we really look hard every quarter and we refresh and reforecast and iterate. Right now, you are probably needing to look more frequently than that because if you think about the difference between last week and this week in terms of your investment and your focus, it's probably changed. So uh, think about how this plays with your operating rhythm And whichever of these things you're doing, essentialism, red teaming, even overs, barbell or horizons framework, think about how often you're getting your leadership team or whatever altitude of team is really doing refreshment. Think about how often you're getting together and saying like, what do we know now? What's changed now? What's different now than it was two weeks ago or a month ago that we need to be considering? 
It's funny you say that because there's this law that's mentioned in the little book of Beyond Budgeting that talks about the law of requisite variety, which is the idea that you need to kind of have a similar amount of complexity or nuance inside the system as the kind of context or the market with which it faces. I think there's a, another law that we have to sort of make up or coin or that someone that's listening can tell us what it's called, which is you need to have a similar cycle time. Mm hmm as the external environment. So if it's changing on the daily, you need to be changing on the daily, if it's changing monthly and so on. And so the idea that somehow through all different periods of human history, the annual planning calendar is the right rhythm is just weird. Mm -hmm. It's weird to me. Like you should be looking at what is the moment? What is the nature of it? How fast is it pacing? And then that's the rhythm on which we do this work. Right. Like any complex system, any system that grows and changes. It's like, you wouldn't look at your kid once a year and be like, what should we teach it? You wouldn't <laughs> look at a forest <laughs> once or a garden once a year and be like, how is it going? Like you need to yeah. match the pace at which things are changing. Yeah. Cadence is king. So the next thing we should hit on is prioritization. There are a lot of folks out there right now who are making tough choices, who are pivoting quickly, who are like, what do we invest in and core business versus wild swings like we talked about earlier. So if you are a person who owns a roadmap or who owns strategy, what are you thinking about right now in terms of prioritization? And uh, and in a sec, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples to respond to. Yeah. Well, I mean, big picture, I would be thinking about, you know, where are we now? So what, what does it mean to be reactive to the moment? I would be thinking about where do we need to be? So what is it going to look like? You know, what is my belief about the time horizon of this event? And where do we want to be positioned afterwards? Sort of like we talked about with um, essential intent. And then I would also be thinking about what can I do now if my capacity to do what I normally do is reduced, that is kind of off book, but would still keep the business alive. So are mm -hmm. there kind of off label uses for my uh, services, for my structures, for my assets? Yeah, a distillery that's about three blocks from my house in Durham, way, way early, like before any real trappings of the pandemic had landed, just immediately converted to making hand sanitizer. <laughs> They're just like, we got this. And it was genius. And and uh, they did it in, you know, in a very sweet way, which was for all of the local businesses, and they were just right. giving it away. Right. But to your point, smartly use their infrastructure, use their knowledge, use what they had to make a really interesting pivot. I would imagine if they wanted to be selling that hand sanitizer, they could be. Totally. Yeah. And I think in this moment in particular, since it's kind of a humanitarian crisis, um, you know, your strategy does not have to be exclusively focused on profit. Sure. So, you know, like it's cool to just make hand sanitizer for the community because it's good for the community. And mm -hmm. what a great use of like you've you've created this resource, you've created this system, and now you can help. And maybe that's enough. And frankly, you know, if you if you want to think about upside, I'm sure there's going to be huge reputational and social benefits for companies that do things like that in this moment. So maybe, you know, maybe you're staring down the barrel of like, I can't do anything legitimately profit generating with my assets right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Well, you know, they're passing a bailout. Maybe the, maybe you'll get carried. But what can you do anyway? Like, what mm -hmm. can you do with your people? What can you do with your time? And and so that's still strategy. It's just a different. Uh, it's a different level of the chessboard. So, if you were someone who's running a business that's been really heavily impacted, say in the culinary world, say you are someone who's running a small chain of restaurants, what are you thinking about right now, strategy wise? Well, I think, I mean, it, it's funny, we just, you know, recently stopped working with a restaurant. And so I've been reaching out to them and, and finding out what they're up to. I think the obvious moves people are already doing, which is, you know, switching to delivery, etc. But there's a demand problem there. Where, you know, you just if you've been doing 80% of your business on premise, you're not gonna be able to make up the difference overnight. So I would be thinking about things I could do to, you know, scale that. So one part of that would be the for profit side which is, you know, how can I get in front of more customers? How can I offer to kind of connect the dots for people? So I'd probably be doing door-to-door -door work um, with just leaving, you know, a card explaining that we're in the area that we're doing it. I think one thing that a lot of restaurants are missing is that a big part of the holdup on getting delivery or getting pickup is fear. Mm -hmm. And most of the systems I've seen are like, oh, yeah, we've, you know, stepped up our procedures generically and we're doing delivery. I think I would go way over the top. I would be like, Everyone in our system is temperature checked every 60 minutes. 
we have, you know, we're doing new gloves with every order. No one is, you know, touching anything with bare hands in our entire facility. Like I would get really aggro and kind of um, Howard Hughesy about it with with our messaging so that people know like, all right, well, if I have to order from somewhere, you know, this place is, you know, sterile beyond measure. So, of course, that's my go to if I'm, you know, in a part of the population that's worried. Um, so that's one thing. And then related to what we just talked about, uh, you know, what can we do that's of service? And so, mm -hmm. you know, Sweet Green, for example, is delivering salads to hospitals for free. Mm -hmm. um, they've got the infrastructure, they've got the supply chain, they can get it done. And, it, you know, that really, really helps right mm -hmm. now. So I think, again, it doesn't always have to be serving the brand's pocketbook in this moment. It might serve the brand's halo effect, and it might just serve our basic humanity to do something like that. So th mm -hmm. those would be the things I would be thinking about in in that space. And what if you're a company that has seen unprecedented use or growth in this moment that you weren't even expecting, like a Zoom? <laughs> yeah, it is interesting to watch the the ones that are in high demand scramble. Um, you know, I actually think most of them are doing a pretty good job, uh, in part because a lot of them are, you know, fairly future of work oriented companies. But um, if you look at Zoom or you look at Slack, it seems like the playbook is uh, all hands on deck in terms of keeping it up, because the most important mm -hmm. thing is just having the infrastructure there. Because, you know, legitimately, people solving this crisis are relying on that infrastructure. So there was a huge post dropped by, um, by Stuart, mm -hmm. uh, who runs Slack, on Twitter yesterday that was basically like, this is everything we've been thinking about and what we've been dealing with. And inside it were a lot of notes to the team. And the notes of the team were, were genuinely great. They were just like, hey, you know, people are relying on us. We got we to gotta keep this thing up and running. And over time, as they realized that they were going to be able to do that and they were pulling that off, take care of yourselves, take mm -hmm. care of your families, like don't overdo it. You know, we need to be there for this moment, but we don't need to kill ourselves. So a nice balance of kind of, um, you know, wartime focus and attention with, with empathy and with connection, mm -hmm. uh, which is not usually what you expect. You usually expect just the like, you know, die on the battlefield kind of vibe yeah. from a leader. And I think there's a, a bit of a, we have to make this work for the long haul attitude in, in those companies. So I think, you know, focusing on uptime is the number one priority. I think the second priority that both of them are doing fairly well, um, Slack and Zoom, is how do we help people on board to this new reality? Mm -hmm. So actually building a lot more kind of training, onboarding, content, things that help people get up to speed very quickly. And then frankly, and this is where I think everybody is struggling, is using this as, as a kind of a test kitchen for recognizing what's hard about our product, what's mm -hmm. hard to get like off the bat, because a lot of people are just hitting it at the same moment and you're getting this massive influx of data of what confuses people, what's hard for people. Um, you know, what could we change that would make this thing more adoptable mm -hmm. um, as opposed to just adaptable? So, so I think that's, you know, that's a huge priority. The other two things that come to mind with those technologies in particular, just based on some things that we're seeing in terms of our clients out there is um, one, like to my friends at Zoom, write the articles about why video over phone. Because there are still a lot of people in traditional yeah. organizations in the world who are like, meh, I'm just going to leave my camera off. And right now <laughs> in this moment, like, no, none of us want to be on Zoom calls eight hours a day like many of us are. And there is a time and a place where it's really helpful in terms of connection. And we know sure. there's research around trust. And there's also the multitasking play, et cetera. It's real hard to find that and have that at your fingertips. And I've got people yeah. asking me for it. And like, I don't have time to write it right now. So Zoom, you write it. And the other thing is, Again, if you have a technology that you believe is of service to a remote workforce that has not historically been adopted by more traditional bureaucracies, figure out right now what your narrative is around security. Because like Slack should be helping large organizations figure out why Slack is okay. Because it has a lot of other things that other technologies don't in terms of accessibility that are important. And right. there are a lot of big old companies that just say no to things like yeah. Slack or things like G Suite. And so I'm looking to those companies to help organizations like in the government and like large healthcare organizations that just out of hand say, we won't use those products because of security concerns. And what's great about both of those ideas is they can be baked right into the product. Mm -hmm. So imagine booting up Zoom for the first time, and when you open it and you don't turn video on, a modal comes up, and it's like, here's the HBR article, here's the data. Are you sure you don't want to turn your video on? Mm -hmm. 
boom, like you've just already done the work for every single user ever. And nobody has to share articles or do any of that crap. And there could be like a one touch button in the app that just says like dump data on why zoom. And it just dumps it into the chat, right? Like yeah. th that kind of thing is so easy to get going. And then to your point about security, same story. Like imagine it boots up and it's like, hey, are you booting this up as a security professional inside a company? Yes, I am. Well, here's our entire white paper and here's why, you know, the the Fed trusts us and here's why yada, 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 right? Like you could do that mm -hmm. right inside the product. And mm -hmm. I think, had, you know, had they done that, you know, even more roadblocks would be removed in this moment. Mm-hmm. The other sort of contenty strategy question I want to ask you is just about brick and mortar. So like everybody on earth is like, we deliver, we have an online store, <laughs> go click my page. And, and, you know, even in week two, it's kind of like, oh my God, I know I, I got the sale message again. Uh, what else can industries and companies like retail and like hospitality who really rely on the in-person brick and mortar experience be doing right now besides just being like, we're having a sale online, here's a coupon? Well, I think mostly it's about being relevant. So uh, some some aspects of this are really hard to surmount, right? If you, if you run something that's hospitality driven or a restaurant or something like that, um, you know, you're not, unless you really pivot your business, which is a legitimate option, you're not going to end up in a in a better place immediately. So, uh, you know, for example, O'Reilly the other day came out and just was like, no more in-person conferences ever, mm -hmm. basically. We're just yep. going all digital. We're going to be the virtual leader, yada, yada, yada. That's, that's one way to play. Like, just move your chips and move to another table and start that business. I think that's that's legitimate. The other thing, though, that you can do is just be more contextually relevant. So um, one of our previous guests, Mr. Ben Kaufman, uh, the camp store almost within, I would say within a day or two started sending me things like, Hey, I bet you're homeschooling your kid camp is now your partner in that. Here's a workbook here, like stuff that they were just building on the fly day by mm -hmm. day to serve. And then here are some toys that are educational that are connected to your kid's educational needs in this moment. So it wasn't just like buy our stuff online. It was mm -hmm. like, our stuff is now tailored to your situation which I thought was really clever. Um, it, you know, it moved us like one step closer. And again, that's not going to make up for 80% of missing demand, but it certainly is a lot more fun to open when you're like, yeah, that's my actual problem right now. My problem right now is like not just needing to buy a toy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think everybody can start to think about that. You know, same thing with restaurants. Like if you're a very local restaurant, that's not a chain and you can get really community centric, you could start thinking like, all right, everybody's doing these all day zoom meetings, they're going to need lunch at a particular time. How can I how can I, you know, manage some kind of daily automatic subscription that says, hey, we'll, you know, we'll bring your lunch uh, every day at noon, you don't have to think about it, it's set and forget. Mm -hmm. um, or we'll do it once a week, and you can put them all in your fridge or what like thinking about things you could do to sort of take the tax off of the user mm -hmm. um, would be really interesting. And I did that for myself. Unfortunately, I end up buying and freezing a bunch of you know, noodles, bowls or something. And it was like, all right, now I pull one of these out every day. But I'd much rather have it just show up on the doorstep, um, mm -hmm. at, you know, at the right time for the family, so I don't have to store it and all that. So I think thinking in terms of how can I add context and convenience in this moment is a really good place to start. Yeah. And just thinking about what needs are like, what I'm seeing in a lot of the workforce right now is more need for connection, more need for play, more need for um, like stimulation that we are yeah. missing at, yeah. at work that we normally get because we're in yep. person and we're like high fiving and then we're going and having drinks after work and we're doing all the things that human beings do. Like if I were in a traditional business right now uh, that relied on in-person connection, I would be thinking cleverly about how to create that connection in a different way yes. through something more than just a financial transaction. I really wish somebody would start thinking about experiences now, particularly after work experiences. Like everybody's jumping on Zoom with friends, everybody's Netflix partying, but like imagine packaging up an actually interesting experience that you could do with friends. I went looking for an online escape room the other day that I could do yeah. with other friends really hard to find surprisingly hard to find not that you can't find one to do alone but right. like why can't you jump into a room with friends and do that for two hours while you have a drink why it's was i not to invited to that also well because it doesn't exist okay good i just <laughs> want to be sure that you weren't doing something fun without me um Never. yeah 
That's ex- that's exactly that's exactly it. I've been looking for something that looked like an easily accessible cloud based game that I could like host a weekly thing for a client where people could just get together for thirty minutes yes. and like yes. play and talk shit to each other. And it's not that easy to find. Surprisingly hard to find. Surprisingly hard to find if you don't have hardware and it's not behind a paywall or a login or whatever. I'm like, come on, man! Like, where's the distraction? <laughs> like, where's the water cooler for this moment? Surely yeah. some traditional business that has nothing to do right now with its assets could make us one of those. Oh my God, totally. And I saw somebody tweet the other day that uh, this was VR's moment and it wasn't ready. Yeah. Like if <laughs> right. you, you know, if it was like two years further along and you could just like jump into VR with your homies and do stuff, that would be, it would be like, we'd never go back. It'd be ready player one yep. from here on out, but yeah. they missed it. So it'd have to be a future pandemic. Uh, and with that said, I think we're going to shut it down because we're we've definitely been uh, running on strategies. One of those topics that you could really uncork and and sit with all night. Uh, Rodney, thanks for being here again. <laughs> Happy to do it. And uh, guys, do us a solid and uh, review us and share us. All right, we are trying to help lots of folks out as we make this series in this weird and challenging moment, and we really can't do that without you. So if you can uh, pass the word along to a couple of folks in the next couple of days, that would really hook us up. Do it. Um, a quick tip of the hat to Taylor Marvin for making us sound good. Brave New Work is produced by The Ready, where we help organizations around the world change the way they work. You can get in touch with us by emailing podcast at the And as for you, thanks for listening. Now go change something. <laughs>